Humanity is male and man defines woman, so Simone de Beauvoir says. Man is granted the authority to define woman on the basis that he, being rational, sees the world as it is to be seen, while woman, being emotional, does not. If Beauvoir revealed the author behind the definition of woman, Kate Millett revealed the content of this definition. In 1970, she published Sexual Politics, the overarching argument of which is that sex is a political category. Andrea Dawkins describes this book as having woken the world from its slumber. The book is magisterial. In the first part, Kate illustrates her proposition that sex has a frequently neglected political aspect via an, an analysis of sexual scenes in Henry Miller and Norman Mailer's novels. In the second, she shifts into the historical mode and attempts, as she says, to formulate a systematic overview of patriarchy as a political institution. In the third and final section, she shifts back to the mode of literary criticism and analyzes D. H. Lawrence, Henry Miller, and Norman Mailer's novels, arguing that these novels are counter-revolutionary, by which she means that they are expressions of resistance to and attempts to thwart women's liberation. Kate considers the second section, the historical section, the most important. I find this interesting because, for whatever it's worth, I've always found the first and third sections, the literary criticism, to be wherein she makes her great contribution. I'm going to focus on the third section, as it's here that she gives us an insight into the content of the male definition of woman. As I've said, she characterizes Lawrence Miller and Mailer's novels as counter-revolutionary. This characterization is provocative because these novels are widely taken to be precisely the opposite, at least in one sense. That is, they're taken to be expressions of a sexually liberal attitude, an argument for sexual freedom and against social norms that restrain sexuality's expression. I like Kate's characterization not only because I think it's spot on, but also because Lawrence Miller and Mailer would hate nothing more than to be described as sexual conservatives. Kate begins with Lawrence's novel, Lady Shadowley's Lover, which was published in limited and censored forms as early as 1928, but not in full until 1960. Lawrence described it as, I'm trying to resist the urge to roll my eyes. Lawrence described it as the most improper novel in the world. Kate shows that nothing could be further from the truth. On the one hand, the novel is about Lady Constance Shadowley's sexual relationship or affair with the gamekeeper. Uh, on the other hand, it isn't about anything at all. It's just, in Simone de Beauvoir's words, a guidebook for women, an instruction manual in how to be a good woman. Constance is an intellectual woman living the life of the mind. As a result of her upbringing, which involved going to Paris and Florence and Rome to see art and to the Hague in Berlin to attend great socialist conventions, she is, Lawrence says, not the least daunted by either art or ideal politics and is perfectly at home arguing with men over philosophical, sociological and artistic matters. This philosophical argument with a man is, Lawrence says, for her the great thing and sexual relations only a sort of primitive reversion and a bit of an anticlimax. She marries a baronet, Sir Clifford Shatterley, who then goes off to war, from which he returns paralysed from the waist down. To cut a long story short, she meets the gamekeeper, who teaches her the source of true fulfilment, sex. So you can see why Kate calls Lawrence a counter-revolutionary sexual politician. He is arguing that feminism, encouraging women to develop their intellects, has led to a generation of women, modern women, who are deep down unfulfilled. He is arguing that what a woman really needs is just a good fuck. And what exactly is a good fuck? Kate's major contribution is to show that it is an act of male supremacy. She draws attention to Connie's description of the gamekeeper's penis. It is risen against her with silent, amazing force and assertion. It is potent, lordly, towering, terrifying. She also draws attention to the roles of male and female in the sexual scenes, namely active and passive. The gamekeeper tells Connie to come here or lie down, or in probably what is most like the most kind of overtly violent sexual scene, he falls upon her from behind and takes her. Connie does as she is told. She lies down, she is inert, she waits in terror, she yields, she is helpless. The man commands, the woman submits. 
And in a good fuck, she not only submits, but she experiences she experiences sexual ecstasy in doing so. In the novel, it's this experience that creates her as a woman. Lawrence says, she was gone, she was not, and she was born a woman. Kate also draws attention to the fact that it is Connie who narrates the sex scenes. By speaking his sexual fantasy through Connie, Lawrence makes his representation of female nature appear the authentic expression of it. As such, he makes it something that women must model themselves on. Kate moves from D.H. Lawrence to Henry Miller. Miller's depictions of women are characterised by contempt that Lawrence's aren't. In his novels, men find sexual pleasure in degrading women. Indeed, in Tropic of Capricorn, he writes of a male character. This is a lengthy passage. He took pleasure in degrading her. I could scarcely blame him for it. She was such a prim, priggish bitch in her street clothes. You'd swear she didn't own a cunt the way she carried herself in the street. Naturally, when he got her alone, he made her pay for her highfalutin ways. He went at it cold-bloodedly. Fish it out, he'd say, opening his fly a little. Fish it out with your tongue. Once she got the taste of it in her mouth, you could do anything with her. Sometimes he'd stand her on her hands and push her around the room that way, like a wheelbarrow. Or else he'd do it dog fashion, and while she groaned and squirmed, he'd nonchalantly light a cigarette and blow the smoke between her legs. Once he played a dirty trick doing it that way. He had worked her up to such a state that she was beside herself. Anyway, after he had almost polished the ass off her with his back scuttling, he pulled out for a second, as though to cool his cock off, and shoved a big long carrot up her twat. Notice the role that, high, that her higher class membership plays here, placing her at a height from which she can be made to fall. It is a precondition for her degradation. Intersexual feminists talk of higher class membership as something that advantages women, making them better off than their counterparts in the lower class. They, they fail to see what Kate does. First, that men have invented class for their sexual purposes. And second, that if they have, and if higher class membership is just another way that men make women degradable, then it hardly advantages women, certainly not as women. Kate focuses on Lawrence and Miller's novels and places them in succession because she considers them expressions of the male view of woman. But these novels differ in their portrayals of women. Lawrence describes Connie as pure and innocent, while Miller insists that all women are dirty. The gamekeeper expresses admiration, or at least of a certain sort, for Connie, while Miller shows only contempt for women. If they differ, then we can speak of them only as expressions of different male views of women, which I think undermines the feminist claim that patriarchy is a system with a coherent ideology. Kate doesn't really say exactly how these portrayals are continuous with one another. At one point, she suggests that Miller's novels are expressions of one sort of patriarchal ideology and Lawrence's another, but this is an evasion of the question, not an answer to it. However, I think that by placing Miller alongside Lawrence, Kate allows us to see. Both Lawrence and Miller portray the good fuck as an act of conquest, an act in which a man bends a woman to his will, an act of violation. And both portray a woman, a woman as properly vi violable, as something that ought to be violated, as someone whose nature is realised in being violated. The difference between the two is that Lawrence holds on to the idea that women may be pure and innocent, and thus that they may be defiled. Miller, who believes that all women are dirty, has given up on this idea. Because he believes that all women are dirty, he sees what it takes to violate them as something much worse, something much more violent and humiliating and degrading than Lawrence does. So to return to the beginning, if man defines woman, how does he define her? As Kate shows us, what serves his sexual desire? A desire for power, 